long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a Doof Media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. My name is constant reader Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by constant writer Matt Freeman. How's it going, Matt? It's going well. I'm looking forward to visiting some very, very distant levels of the tower with you this week. (laughs) Yeah, we've got a very special bonus episode for you folks this week. This is our Do the King Thing celebration episode. We did a whole contest where you guys wrote a bunch of stories and voted on winners. And now we're ready to read and discuss the stories. But some of you out there might be wondering why we called it Do the King Thing. That's a weird name for it. And the reason, actually, is because we have another podcast on the Doof Media Network called Do the Right Thing, uh, which is a writing prompt podcast. And we were doing this whole contest in uh, cooperation, in collaboration with our friends over at Do the Right Thing. So we thought it'd be pretty important to have them here to talk about the stories that won the contest. So everyone, please welcome Alexandra and Jarvis from Do the Right Thing. Hello, guys. Hey, uh, hi, hi, how are we, how are we? I love the uh, thunderous applause that you've set up here that yeah. only I can hear. Yeah, I actually, I mean, I have a soundboard right here, but I don't remember which one is the applause and I'm afraid I'll hit the boo one and that just wouldn't be good. <laughs> yeah, we magic. should try it out, see what happens. I just love attention, so it works out either way. <laughs> well, that's what, that's what, that's why we write. So. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Just to be seen. Mm hmm. So before we get into these three winning stories, uh, could you both kind of explain what do the right thing is? What 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 do you do each week on your podcast and, and writing prompt exercise? Yeah, this is the podcast idea we stole from Matt, actually, <laughs> um, where they did uh, so-called writers for a while, where um, they generated three random words and then wrote a story um, and had listeners also write along with them. And uh, y'all went on hiatus and... I still wanted to do it. So eventually, I think like a year later, um, Jarvis and I started doing the same thing, basically. Going, been going for like, what, is it like two, three years now? We're going on two years. Uh, yeah, straight. Because wow. I think we did take a short hi- hiatus, but yeah, we've been consistent. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing because me and Michael had the stamina for like 13 episodes or something. <laughs> and then we were like, well, uh, <laughs> oh my God. Um, no, but it's, it, it's a really, it's a fun, it's a fun thing. I mean, I recommend that people do it if they have an interest in writing because, um, writing for 30 minutes a week is not, not that much of an ask really, you know, and, mm-hmm, and then yeah. it, you, you get mm-hmm. the feeling of accomplishment. Um, it does improve your skills over time. And, uh, frankly, one of the major benefits that I found when I was doing it r- regularly is I would just have way way more story ideas like i'd Mm -hmm. I'd have like like a couple of story ideas every day whereas if i'm not writing story ideas maybe come up you know once a week or something like that Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no um it's great so uh the way it goes is you set a timer for 30 minutes and then you have um four random uh randomly generated words that we've uh assigned for that week and then you just pick three of them and try to make a story out of it um, it's been pretty effective, I think. It's surprisingly effective compared to uh, traditional prompts, which is, I never thought I'd be elitist about writing prompts. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and also like a really cool thing is that as, as soon as you do uh, submit your story, we get to read it and we get to really talk about it, uh, give, give ad- advice, give critiques. But at the end of the day, we're always looking just to gas you up because it is hard just to sit down and and right, especially when you're busy, like like me or uh, Alex. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the cool things about the the concept to me is just it, it's it's relatively low pressure because I like I think even Stephen King would struggle to write like a good story in just 30 minutes you know like the the pressure is kind of off as like it, it's not it's not about making a quote-unquote good story it's about making a story it's about doing the right thing mm-hmm. um it's, it's it's just wow. getting out there and doing the writing um and and that's what i love about it so let's say you know our listeners right now are like wow that sounds interesting i submitted a story for for do the king thing and i didn't know about this this whole other podcast i want I want to participate. How how would they kind of get plugged in to start participating in this? Uh, honestly, I think uh, the quickest way to do it would probably just to find us on our uh, sub subreddit, which is slash r slash do the right thing. Uh, there you'll you'll see the latest post with the four randomly uh, generated words, and you can just hop in and uh, start writing. And you can also follow us on on Twitter if um, you're on Twitter more than you are on Reddit. 
Yeah, great. And I think, you know, you guys allow people to submit stories, you know, to be considered and read on the podcast. But if you don't, if you're not up to that, you can always just write in the the submission post, hey, please don't, please don't read my story uh, or read it, but please don't read it on air. Um, so if, you, if you're feeling uncomfortable about your writing, you, it's not like you're, you're pledging yourself to be to be talked on air or anything right mm-hmm. yeah for sure for sure i mean we've had um some audience members talk about like some very personal things as well um mm-hmm. really like practicing their nonfiction writing skills and and such um and it's i think it's really important to respect that obviously um but also it's, it's just like the level of critique as well i i know some people were a little bit nervous about getting harsh criticism which is not really I mean, we'll we'll provide advice and stuff. We're not going to tear someone down or anything. This is not of like course not. Yeah. a college creative writing <laughs> class <laughs> where uh, we got to feel good about ourselves by making someone else feel bad. So I just mm-hmm. want the the episode where Jarvis is on there and says, um, I've got a question. What the fuck were you thinking? here?" <laughs> <laughs> I had that happen in one of my classes, actually. Pretty yeah, much. I bet. Mm-hmm. I bet. Oh, yeah. my God. That's awful. I think he, um, he called it uh, the most disappointing story that he <laughs> <laughs> read this year or something like that. Jesus. It was pretty full on. Oh, oh my god! I think I think I know the uh, teacher you're you're talking about too. No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't the professor. It was just this. Uh, this. Oh, just, I mean, I was pretty guy. harsh on his piece, so it was kind that's, of fair. I, for some reason, to me, that's worse that it, that it was just to some other well, student. It, he really, he really looked the type, y'all. Like I don't know, oh, just, glasses. It, he wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't wearing a. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse just me, just fucking glasses. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was wearing. He's the type that like would wear a beret if he wasn't already hadn't already been made fun of for that um Ew. like a scarf kind of in in class kind of guy you know anyway mm, i got you <laughs> all right um for for the contest that we did though we wanted to take your idea and kind of Stephen kingify it for our kingslingers podcast so our challenge to our contestants was write a short story i believe matt we put a 2000 word limit on it is that yeah, correct 2000 words relatively short you know mm-hmm. um Honestly, you could probably write 2,000 words in 30 minutes, but that would be a stretch. So we were, we yeah. were kind of aiming for something on the order of, of what uh, is typically seen in the Do the Right Thing Challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, we we encouraged, you know, editing and and, uh, yeah. and Im- improvement of the story. And we also kind of just, we, we had a very broad prompt, which is just make it Stephen King-esque. And we kind of let <laughs> our let our writers kind of define what that meant to them. You know, I think in in some cases it was a lot of very direct references. In some cases it was just tone or type of characters. Um, Everyone just kind of took that and ran with it in their different way, which was really, really cool. Um, So I guess before we get into the, the the winning stories, I'm just curious for the two of you, how familiar are you with Stephen King and, and how, how was your ability to to determine the Stephen King esqueness of any of these stories? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that I'm pretty familiar with Stephen King. I know I uh, grew up with uh, reading the um, Night Shift collection of uh, um, yeah. short short stories, which I like really loved. Um, and I've read some of the Dark Tower. Sadly, I haven't finished the, the series. Um, but yeah, I would say that I'm fairly f- familiar with his lo- with his larger works. Um, but I'm still trying so hard to get through the the. Uh, talisman which has been a trial Hmm. oh yeah i i love that book um we're gonna be covering talisman on season two eventually actually so oh nice yeah Yeah, no it's it's a great book just just long (laughs) it is it is a very long one yeah i think our i think we're doing it's gonna be like a 15 episode -er. (laughs) we're gonna be on that book for (laughs) like three months so yeah yeah what about you alex um, I saw the Carrie remake, so, <laughs> mm. uh, I don't think I've read any of his, um, like actual, uh, books that, that are, that are fictional. I read mm. on writing, um, mm. and I saw <laughs> it as well. Also the remake, I, uh, and the shining, which I know is not at all like the book. I think that's it. That's basically my entire, um, connection to Stephen King's works. Cool. Um, well, some of these stories are going to be very interesting for you. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's there's a couple in here that are very specific Dark Tower referencey. So uh, th- that's going to be some fun stuff to talk about. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's get right into the story. We're going to start with our third place story. Um, and the way this is going to work for everyone at home, we are going to kind of read the story out loud. It's going to take about 10 minutes per story. And then uh, and then we're just going to talk about it. So we're going to begin with our third place story, which was. This is The Parking Lot by Dylan Trude. Lately, Calvin DeWitt doesn't want to spend time with his mother. He has been refusing to go see her at her nursing home since he graduated high school. It is not because he hates her. It is because she is dealing with early-onset Alzheimer's. This scares Calvin more than anything. He's afraid of having to deal with the loss and pain of having his mother's mind deteriorate so early in his life. Though he is quite self-aware for his age, 19, there are gaps in his awareness. He's aware of the fact he may have to deal with this brain disease one day as well. He's unaware of how his fear of loss regarding his mother's mind is manifesting in resentment toward her. Throughout his high school years is when the brain disease began to dig its greasy nails into his mother, Rebecca. When he was 14, he noticed how whenever he'd get home from school, they'd greet one another and he'd catch his mom glancing over his shoulder. Cal could see the fear on his mother's face. Whatever it is that she thought she saw chilled her to the bone. Once, just before Cal turned 16, while he was learning to drive in the old Kmart parking lot, Rebecca would be talking to him from the passenger seat and suddenly zoned out while Cal was driving. Mom? Are you okay? Cal said as he stopped their red Honda Accord. There was a squeal of pain from the brake pads. Rebecca just kept looking forward, her face painted with a blank, nameless fear. Mom, what's the matter? His voice cracking in panic. Suddenly, Rebecca was back. You did great, Cal. Now... Now switch spots with me. I'll drive us home. As if she'd lost no time or was pretending not to notice. The drive home was worse. Cal kept seeing her look back at her rearview mirror in intervals long enough for her to just start veering off the road. Finally, Cal said something when a spattering of gravel from the side of the road hit his side of the car. Cal spat, Mom, what's happened to you? First you go blank while I'm driving, now you can't take your eyes off the road behind us as if we're being chased? Rebecca paused to look back in her mirror again before answering tersely. Nothing's wrong. You know what, Mom? That's bullshit. Hey, mister, don't use that language with me. Bullshit! You've been looking like you're hiding from something for years now. Can you just tell me what's wrong? A long silence began as she just stared into her son's eyes. Rebecca's denial filled the air with a palpable humidity. She didn't answer. Calvin looked out his window and began to quietly cry his first tears since their cat Bubsy died when he was twelve. Breaking the silence, Rebecca let out a blood-curdling scream, Leave me alone! and yanked the wheel of the accord to the left, hard. They both woke up in the hospital with broken bones, but the only real damage was to their relationship. Calvin stopped talking to his mom outside of the base level of communication between a mother and son. During his junior year of high school, Rebecca was finally diagnosed with early-onset Alzheimer's, and Calvin's growing terror and sense of despondency finally had a name. As the disease progressed within her, Cal grew more and more distant and emotionally numb. Senior year came and went, and shortly after Cal's graduation, which his mom was absent from, he got a job and a cheap half-in-the-ground apartment. Rebecca was moved to a nursing home. At 19, Calvin works late shifts at a local fast food restaurant, and for the past two weeks he feels as though someone or something is watching him. One night, as he was driving home past the empty Kmart parking lot, his eyes were drawn to the unnaturally flickering lights over the parking lot. 
The eeriness of the random flickering defied reason, turning the ordinary abandoned parking lot into an unknowable swath of an alien world. Just then, the lights all went dark for a brief moment, except one, which kept flickering. Under the light was a dark figure. It's outlined like smoke, and despite being in the direct light, it completely lacked detail, save for one haunting exception. Its orange, flickering eyes. Cal sped past the parking lot, thinking to himself that he needs to sleep more, that the long work hours and lack of sleep were catching up to him. He vowed to sleep in on his two-day weekend. He can't sleep, though. Something about the figure from before keeps him locked in place in his own bed, staring at his ceiling until the sun pokes its face out over the horizon. Only then does he finally nod off for a less than stellar three hours of sleep. The next two nights are no different. Work is a struggle. The feeling of being watched has painted every moment since he saw the dark figure. He can't maintain focus on his tasks, instinctually looking over his shoulder. He's afraid of going into the freezer alone. When talking to customers or his coworkers, he finds himself breaking eye contact and peering over people's shoulders, always on the lookout for the figure he saw. With the end of his shift, what he'd been dreading had come. He must drive home past the empty parking lot. The lights are still flickering, and he can't help but slow down and pull over, waiting to see if his phantom will show itself again. Just as he starts to feel certain that he'd been psyching himself out for the past couple of days, all the lights' sporadic flickering stop. Just one light is still on, and under it is the figure, its eyes glowing the unsteady orange, like cutouts in the inky surface of a jack-o'-lantern, with a withering inferno blazing somewhere behind the holes. It reached an arm up towards him. Before Cal can catch the rest of the gesture, he's cursing to himself and trying to start his car. It won't start, and a raw, animalistic panic sets over him, and he slams his wheel. Come on, start, you piece of shit! He shouts at his car and just then his engines turns over. As he regains control and starts driving away, he spares one glance at the place the figure had been. And although the parking lot's lights still flickered eerily, the figure was nowhere to be seen. Just as a semblance of calm starts to take hold in Cal, he suddenly sees he's about to run someone over. He swerves, but it's too late. He freezes up, Mortified, anticipation for a sickening speed bump keeping him locked in place. A full second passes, and there's no bump. Cal instinctually looks in his rearview mirror to see what he thinks he hit, and sees those two horrible eyes staring back at him, an odd forlornness to them, like a scared child. In an instant, that look is gone, and the figure rushes down Cal's car in an unnatural, jerky, side-to-side run. It ran at him like a demented clay figure in stop, mo- in stop motion. Though it was outpacing his car, it seemed to barely move in a way that would suggest speed. Cal, now speeding down the road without even looking, unaware he's already going over 60 miles per hour as the dark figure smacks against his rear window. Cal could see one other detail now. The figure had horrible, darker-than-black hands with greasy, wretched fingernails. It slid down his window with the sound of fingernails on chalkboard, first its eyes slipping from view, then its hands. Cal regained control of his car, still in a full panic, his breath hoarse and ragged as if he'd been screaming, although he couldn't remember if he had. After looking forward for a few seconds and catching his breath, he had a horrible feeling that he wasn't alone in his car. He turned his head to look at the figure in his passenger seat. Its surface was incredibly dark.
black as ichor, black as blood in the moonlight. Its horrible orange flame cutouts for eyes didn't look threatening, but frightened. Paralyzed, Cal looked into those glowing, fearful eyes, and the terror within him multiplied. In an instant, its mask of fear melted away, and the look in its eyes was a victorious one. A thin, jagged line cut its way across its face. A serrated grin cut the horrible visage from ear to ear. A rapid, chittering, insect-like laughter buzzed from everywhere at once, and the inside of the car smelled like rotten tooth and burnt paint. Cal panicked, and the dark figure reached its deathly hand out and grabbed his thigh. At the ends of its two long fingers were its greasy, unkempt fingernails that dug themselves into his skin. Although he still had a sense of moving, outside the car wasn't the long country road heading back into town, but a black void with no discernible detail. Calvin thought of his mother. His biggest regret now was not being there for her as her mind slipped away. He shut his eyes against the nightmare in his car. I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry, he whispered to himself as he accepted this fate. The figure stretched over the center console. He could feel its weight shifting grotesquely. He could feel its breath on his neck, somehow simultaneously hot and clammy and cold as death. The sound of the figure's jaw spreading open was the sound of styrofoam being ripped apart. It was enough to make Calvin open his eyes again. The top and bottom half of its head were spread out wide enough to engulf Cal's head and upper torso in a single bite. Cal stared into the abyss that was this thing's maw. I deserve this, he thought. If I had another chance, I'd make sure my mom knew I loved her. No matter how much it hurts me to see her, and what makes her my mom slowly melt away, I'd want to be there. I never hated her. I was just afraid of the pain. Loss is the other face of love, and by avoiding one, I blocked the other. The figure loosened its grip and shrunk down to that of a human silhouette, and its fearful mouth closed, and there was no longer a sign that it was on its face at all. The look of apprehension reappeared in those jack-o'-lantern eyes, and it turned its head to look out into the void surrounding the car. Cal's sense of movement came to a halt, and the figure appeared several feet outside the passenger door, its back turned, and faded away into the background. A blinding light hit Cal's eyes from his windshield. The darkness that had formed around the car was gone. The light that blinded him was the sun cresting the horizon, and he was in a parking lot that he didn't immediately recognize. He got out of the car and stumbled, his legs, pins, and needles. When he stood up, he realized where he was. He was at his mother's nursing home. Even though he was exhausted, he walked toward the entrance. Even though he was afraid, he was going to see his mother. All right, so that was the parking lot. Um, I guess we'll start with our, our do the, the right thing guests on this. What did you think of our third place story, the parking lot? Jarvis, you can go first. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I uh, I really did like it. I think that for me, the the hook, uh, the the beginning was a really great moment of just sort of getting you in there and uh, setting the the stage for this. I do like how the red herring of the uh, mother possibly having uh, having Alzheimer's was was placed there, so that when you do get to the later events, you're you're always sort of second guessing. Well, 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 is this a a uh, real dark, dark uh, figure, or um, is this just all in the uh, main uh, character's head? And mm-hmm. I also really do do love how um, later on we get a nice basis on, on what the dynamic between the son and the mother is before it is broken in that same moment. Uh, us sort of seeing the the main character by himself as he is dealing with this um, apparition following him. 
So yeah, I think it's it's, it's a really solid story right uh, right now, and yeah, I think it it does a, a really great job of 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 holding you and really and really taking you you through this without really losing you at any place. Yeah, I, I think some of the most effective moments to me are the uh, like reading the story a second time you kind of realize the mother sitting there glancing around her that she's seeing this exactly. thing the whole time so, and and just like the the creepiness that that is kind of created from just that the general idea that you've been around your mother and this thing has been around her the entire time and and you weren't aware of it that's wonderfully creepy to me alexandra what did uh, what did you think um yeah the i think the theme that's uh being worked with here is is really strong um that struggle of like fearing loss but that also making you lose the person basically yeah um and uh not that like one-to-one metaphors are like necessary or anything like it, the the shadow does not have to represent something mm-hmm. um other than just like vague concepts of like guilt i think um or anything else really um but that it enforces the main character to um confront their fear not for their lives but for their mother's life and just like seeing them go piece by piece basically Mm -hmm. i think yeah it's a really difficult problem to grapple with and i think this story Mm -hmm. does uh address it pretty well yeah i think alzheimer's is one of the things that like scares me the most like the idea of of losing yourself in that way of of, like being alive but losing who you are and i mean in in this story's regard like watching a person you love have to go through that same thing where you're like watching that person kind of go away in a lot of ways that 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 is terrifying to me and i think i think you're right i mean i think the the shadow here represents that the grief and the pain and and in some ways the alzheimer's itself and his his struggle to avoid looking at it to avoid dealing with it and how that thing is just going to relentlessly chase him no matter what like it doesn't it doesn't go away just because you don't look at it um and his accepting of it is what does make it kind of go away and 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 choose to spend the time with his mother that he has which i don't know that's a very you know i know y'all don't know a lot about stephen king but like the thing about stephen king is even when he writes like terrible, depressing, monstrous things, he's like at the end of the day, an optimist at heart. And so like the, the, the end of this for, felt very Stephen King to me, which is like, it's not mm-hmm. like the problem solved. It's not like his mother's cured, but the, the son has at least gotten to a place where uh, he he's grown and, and learned and is going to deal with this more directly than, than the avoidance game he's been playing. And that's, that's feels like a very Stephen King ending to me. Yeah, so the thing that was the most Stephen King about it to me was the heaviness of, of the the premise. You know, you're, you're dealing with Alzheimer's and and the, the loss of a mother at a young age and loneliness, and uh, it's, it's just you know a, a lot of a lot of pathos, a lot of sadness to this character, and and so the the supernatural element is rooted in this really profound and, and effective true heart to the story um, and then and then like you said scott at the end it's actually a pick-me-up um mm-hmm. it, it's about acceptance and it's not a cheap kind of pick-me-up because it's not like oh she's cured of her alzheimer's it's just like no he just he just accepts that this is happening and that the way you know the way out of this is through if you will yeah yeah i i, I love that i think you're totally spot on there yeah yeah um uh, so there's there's a few fun Stephen King references here for those. Uh, I'm just gonna enjoy saying this to y'all because you won't get it. The number <laughs> nine, the number nineteen is very important in the world of Stephen King. So setting the kid's age at nineteen is uh, intentional. Was there a blue chambray work shirt in this one? I don't think there was. That's another remember. Stephen Kingism. Oh my god. Okay, well I recognize it from the <laughs> yeah, other y'all... one. It stuck out to me. <laughs> Yeah. Y'all have deep, deep lore knowledge of Stephen King. <laughs> Look, man, we've been talking about this guy for two hours a week for the last two years. So I get yeah, it. We... I get it. <laughs> um, and I respect I, it. <laughs> the uh, the main character's name is uh, Calvin. Calvin. Calvin starts yeah. with a C and then an mm-hmm. A, just like the character from um, the book Carrie. So that's wow. my oh. extraction that I identified here. Good job. Good job. <laughs> I mean, Calvin is actually a, a name from the Dark Tower and yeah. possibly other stories. I mean, it's 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 a common name, so I'm not that surprised <laughs> about that. But <laughs> there's no accidents in the Dark Tower universe, okay? I gotcha. Mm. 
I, I do. I like the I like the detail of the description when he finally gets to see the the shadowy monster and like oh, it's not yeah. just a shadow. We get a lot of detail like the the darker than black hands with greasy, wretched fingernails. Mm-hmm. I, yes. I, I loved the detail there. I thought that was pretty, pretty gross mm-hmm. and wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Also, also when the creatures like open, I think it's jaw and mm-hmm. started to uh, in uh, engulf the, the car. I think that 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 scene was pulled off very well. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and really was working within all of the tension that was being built up by this chase to sort of give us a nice uh, crescendo before, uh, before, as you said, this sort of heart, heart, heartwarming uh, ending. I, I love the line, uh, the inside of the car smelled like a rotten tooth in burnt paint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So grossest. specific. Yeah, I, I love it. It's pretty gross. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, anything else you guys want to say about the parking lot before we move on to our next story? Um, no, I think we we addressed most of the most important points. Yeah, that was the parking lot by Dylan Trude. So thank you so much, Dylan, and congratulations on winning third place. So let's move on to our second story, which will be Far Away and Faraday by Matthew Newsom. Far Away and Faraday by Matthew Newsom. At the time... I wondered to myself which was worse, that the elevator doors hadn't opened in over an hour, or that the dead body on the trolley next to me was still talking. Looking back, it seems like a pretty clear distinction, but I suffered from some severe claustrophobia then, and I think I would have put up with a few more hours of conversation with old dead Johnny if it meant being out in the open air. He was dead. That's something you need to understand. There was no case of mistaken diagnosis, no wrong patient being bagged up. Nothing that you might see on some crappy medical drama at three in the afternoon on a television of a motel that only gets four channels. No, the John Doe was dead and gone. Until he wasn't. It happened about five minutes after the elevator doors closed, and about four and a half minutes after they were supposed to open up again. Just about shat my damn pants when I heard the voice. I can promise you that. Excuse me. Could you turn the lights on, please? It was almost the voice of a scared child. The man had blown his eyes out of his head with a pistol a few hours before, somehow survived that long enough to be brought to the hospital, and then bled out in the emergency room. And here he was asking why the lights weren't on. I'm telling you it's a miracle my blue scrubs weren't brown by the time they got me out of there. I was busy pounding away at the elevator door, trying to get someone's attention. The security guards who are supposed to answer the emergency button seemed to be ignoring my calls. That or they had fallen asleep at the desk. When I heard him. And my first instinct was to tell him the truth. Buddy, the lights are on. What are you talking about? I guess my brain was trying to trick itself. If someone was asking me a question, then there had to be someone in the room with me, right? Not just a barely cold corpse. Then there was a crack, echoing endlessly inside the metal cage we were in, the most sickening sound I had ever heard up to that point. Then John spoke again. If the lights are on, then why is it so fucking dark? The voice was deeper now, more confident, aware of itself. That should have been my first sign, really, but we'll get to that. It was the curse that made me turn around, going from a mousy, high-pitched, please, to the low, guttural sound of fuck woke my brain up to the fact that there was nobody in the elevator, nobody aside from the body. I pictured the body as it had been when I brought it in, completely flat, sealed in a white body bag, red stains visible on the bottom from all the damn blood. God, there had been so much blood, I should know. I helped them put him in the damn bag and he was soaked. I tell you, just soaked. But it wasn't leaking through onto the steel mortuary trolley, which was a fancy new electric one. It had a fifth wheel in the middle connected to a motor, so only one orderly was needed to push it. Technically, there were supposed to be two of us taking the stiff down to the fridge, but hey, it was midnight. We were halfway through a 12-hour shift, and Mikey had offered to run to the gas station and get us some coffee if I took the dough down on my own. Was I supposed to say no to that? It should have been a five-minute job. Every other time, it was a five-minute job. So the body had been laying flat, rigor mortis just setting in. 
Oh God, rigor mortis, the body was stiff, but there was a crack, and I had pushed it up against the wall. These were spacious elevators, big enough to get two of the trolleys in if you really wanted to, but I had stood by the doors as far from the remains of the head as possible, because he was just starting to smell, and God damn, did I hate being in elevators. I had always had to be the first one out as soon as the doors were open. The body had been laying flat, but then it had spoken, and there had been that awful noise, and then it had spoken again. Every fiber, every inch of my body was screaming, begging me to stay where I was. It was like my nerve endings were on fire, and trying to twist the muscles in my back and legs to turn around was like trying to grab those flames with your bare hands. I wish I had never managed to turn around. I think if I hadn't turned around, it would have killed me. But it would have been a quick death, and I wouldn't have seen a thing. When I turned around, the body was sitting up. The bag was unzipped, almost completely red now, with only a few white patches on the top. The darkest red was around the zipper, which was one of those ones that can be poked through to be opened from outside and inside the bag. That always seems silly to me. Who would need to open a body bag from the inside? The John Doe was, well, painfully average looking from the neck down and ignoring all the blood. An originally blue chambray shirt was now blood-soaked and crimson, with faded blue jeans suffering the same fate. There was a watch on the left wrist, nothing too fancy, not a Rolex or anything crazy, but nice enough to be noticed. But the face. Dear God in heaven, the face. Most people, when they think of suicide via gun, think of either a shotgun in the mouth or a pistol at the side of the head. Both do the same thing, right? In principle, at least. They blow the brains out. Bang. Quick as a flash. Simple as a tiny amount of pressure from your fingers. And it's all over. All over the bedroom walls, that is. <laughs> Roll snare. John Doe, however, clever little fucker that he was, didn't put the gun in the right spot. Held it against his temple, right? Thinking it would get his brains. No. Such. Luck. Severed the optic nerves, blew out the bridge of his nose, and came out the other side of his head to be buried God knows where in some wall nearby. His eyes were destroyed, popped like tiny grapes, the fluid within them mixing with the blood that poured down his ruined face. Worst of all, he lived, the poor bastard. Neighbor heard the shot, called the cops and paramedics. They took Johnny Boy into our emergency, thank our lucky stars, and he screamed the place down until the blood loss took him. Looking at him then as he sat upright facing just to the left of me at the elevator buttons, I swear I could see part of his brain. It's so dark, James, he muttered, going back to that quiet, childlike voice he had started with. It's so dark and cold, but I can't leave. I wanted to say I had a witty retort or some comforting phrase or that Latin bit from the Exorcist movie, but no, I was speechless. What do you say to the living dead? Maybe, how's the weather where you came from? I'll try that next time if I don't claw my own eyes out of the thought of this happening again. I want to leave, James. But I can't. Something's keeping me here, James. The pitch of its voice dipped when it said my name, as if someone else was behind it whispering my name in its ear and telling it to repeat it. How, how do you know my name? I finally managed to stutter. The stammer made me think of a phrase I had heard once as a kid when my brother had been dealing with his own severe speech impediment. There were no posts here for me to hit my fists against, but I sure was seeing a ghost. Your mind goes to strange places when confronted with the impossible. Did you know that? As if conjuring up some meaningless half-forgotten childhood memory could help me ignore the talking corpse in front of me. Someone told me, James... I think he's in the other place, the place I need to go. But I can't, James. It's so dark, and I can't see the way. I pushed the dimmer button for the elevator lights, which were set to low, doubting that making the room brighter would help an eyeless person see, but thinking I could at least tell the doe I had tried. The lights started to brighten, slowly but steadily, and the corpse began to scream. 
It didn't stop for breath. I guess it didn't need to now, but its meaningless noise turned seamlessly into words at some point. It was yelling the words so hard I thought its vocal cords must be ripping in two. More than anything else from this experience, I have tried to forget those words. I can't, though. Sometimes I wake in the night and they are all I can think of. There is an eye at the center of all things, James, and it's looking for me. The king is dead, but the gunslinger carries on, so long live the bloody king. We fall when we die, but when we land, there is someone waiting for us. And he is waiting right now, James. When he reached the end, he started again. No breaks, no breaths. After what felt like hours of this, it was 20 minutes, I checked the times later on, the corpse fell back against the steel of the trolley, exhausted. Seconds after it did so, the elevator doors opened on the basement floor of the hospital, where three security guards and my supervisor were stood waiting to check on me. I swear, when those doors opened, I felt something rush past me and disappear. I did some reading later and found out that some elevators can act as something called a Faraday cage, blocks all signals coming in and out of itself. That's why calls drop out in elevators. See, the signals get blocked. I got to thinking, if the soul exists and it goes somewhere after we die, maybe it's just another type of signal, right? Maybe it hangs around the body for a little bit, then it goes up or down or wherever. And maybe that signal can get blocked sometimes. Maybe that's me trying to make sense of the senseless, but whatever. I never used to care much about my health. I smoked, drank, and did some cheeky drugs on the weekends when my friends had spare. I ate like crap, letting my beer belly develop into a full-blown keg. And the gym and I were like two long-distance lovers kept apart by a never-ending war. Maybe we would be together someday, but it wouldn't be anytime soon. But I'm telling you, after hearing the things that came out of that John Doe's mouth, that dead body's mouth, I cut the crap from my diet, went cold turkey on the smokes and the booze and the narcotics, got a gym membership and kicked all the spare weight to the curb. I get my regular checkups like clockwork, and the doc tells me each time that I'm as fit as can be, and bearing any unforeseen illness or accidents can look forward to a long and healthy life. But it's all for naught, because one day I'll die anyway. And when I do, there's something waiting for me at the bottom. All right, so that was Far Away and Faraday. Uh, I adore the story, y'all. This is deliciously creepy. I, I was the one that got to read this one out loud, and I had such a fun time doing it because it is this frightening like contained like kind of bottle episode of a story um that i absolutely loved uh, alexander what did you think of of this one yeah it's definitely this extremely um uncomfortable moment of being trapped like that i like how we are uh presented with the uh situation the the, the monster the dead body um and then we leave to provide the background which i think mm -hmm. is a great way to uh keep that um tension and foreboding feeling going yeah um, and of course, being trapped in an elevator just by itself is uncomfortable enough. And then you add a dead body with the voice of a child and also a deep and disturbing thing. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the the way the body changed voices multiple times and then like like the i don't even know if i did it justice in my reading but just the idea of saying a name as if it's being whispered in your ear mm -hmm. as you're saying it like you I, I you can hear that for some reason in your head like i can just hear how that would sound um mm -hmm. and it's it's wonderfully wonderfully creepy mm -hmm. jarvis have you ever been trapped in an elevator before <laughs> i actually have Oh, really? Um, okay. Yes. And it's an extremely claust claustrophobic moment uh, within your uh, your life. Um, but yeah, no, definitely by by reading this, this story, I was really going going back to that moment. Uh, and, you know, normally I'm not I'm fine with with uh, tight spaces, me being a giant man. Um, but 
still just just this this story really did up that uh claustrophobia for uh, uh for me um and this, especially just being trapped in this uh tiny cubicle with this dead body that's slowly whispering your uh, uh, your name this this story just did a, such a great job of first of all ho- hooking us in the uh, very first line with what what is happening and staying mm-hmm. here for pretty much the the entire story really really letting that tension build really letting us see this disgusting mangled corpse with eyes and nose just blown out of it. Like the, the description throughout is fantastic. And I love how it's in the parentheses. So it mm-hmm. doesn't break from the flow of, of the real of the story itself, because the form of the story is really sparsed out into really smaller, smaller sections, really allowing you to read this 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 story quicker thus building that that tension yeah the 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 parenthetical kind of um internalized thought thing is a very stephen king technique he's been doing mm-hmm. that you know from his very first book and i think i think this story um captures that that very well i agree with that yeah i mean i it's it's such a fun concept like you take the concept of being trapped in an elevator which is already scary and then go okay but what can i do to make it creepier oh let's put a body in here Oh, but what could I do to make it even creepier? Oh, let's make the body start talking. Um, it's just mm-hmm. this great way of like, it's just like trapped in an elevator when you're claustrophobic, scary. Trapped in an elevator when you're claustrophobic with a body, uh, more scary. Oh, then it starts moving and talking. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Um, <laughs> it's it's really great. I like the, it um, subverts sort of the normal um, expected problem which would be that I am going to be physically confronted with this dead body mm-hmm. and mixed into um, actually, no, the, the, the soul inside the dead body is mostly just scared because mm-hmm, something terrible mm-hmm. is going to happen to it. And it knows that. Um, and I like the way that it reflects on the, the main character, how they walk away from that, um, even more scared about what will happen after their death. Mm-hmm. and yeah. how yeah. that's still inevitable. But Th- that was the thing that jumped out to me as being a bit King is that King, um, often references either directly or indirectly kind of Lovecraftian horror. And mm-hmm. the, it, it wasn't, exp- it's not that this was explicitly Lovecraftian. It's just, it felt Lovecraftian, this idea of like, in reality, not only it, it's not like there's nothing awaiting you beyond death. It's like some nightmares awaiting you beyond death. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. it's like, Oh good. That's, that's creepy. Um, <laughs> yeah. I really love how the story ends. I really love that I that idea. Like the the lions who are like, I never took care of myself. I got out of the situation, and I did, and I I lost all the weight, and I cut out the drinking, uh, and I know that it doesn't matter. <laughs> At the end of the day, it it doesn't matter. And there's something like wonderfully horrifying in those those final lies. But it's all for naught because one day I'll die anyway. And when I do, there's something waiting for me at the bottom. Like just the, at the bottom. It's such a such a uh, good. It's such a good like. Bam to land yeah, on. Yeah, such a good image. Yeah. Speaking of yeah. imagery, like the the horrible explicitness of the gory description of the oh yeah of how the person oh, yeah. tried to tr- tried to kill themselves and just yeah. blew out their eyeballs um, <sighs> was um, a lot. Um, and yeah. I I love it. I mean, I I, I love that stuff. I, I do. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, mm. it was it was just like see that's the thing is my my thing on this show. Um, Alex and Jarvis is that I haven't read all that many King books except for the ones that we read on the show. So Mm. I haven't actually seen him really go into the gore quite that much. Although there's Mm. definitely a few specific gory moments involving faces being blown off by handguns actually. So (laughs) um, it's just, it's just like, wow, this was actually a really, um, it's really gory. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It's like it echoes, it rhymes. <laughs> it rhymes, yeah. It's like poetry. <laughs> very dark hour. There, there is something very unique to short story king, and that's one thing that you haven't mm-hmm. gotten a lot of exposure into, Matt. I Jarvis, it sounds like you have because Night Shift is a, a great short story collection one. Oh um, yeah, one of my one of my favorites actually. When he like, I think King in short stories can be a little bit nastier. Um, he allows some stories to end not optimistic he allows them to end kind of pessimistic or horrifying in the way that this one does i think this very much to me feels like a a story that that i would not find surprised to live in a stephen king short story collection Mm -hmm. definitely yeah there's um i think i can't remember where um i heard this sentiment whether it's actually king related or someone else but um the notion that short stories a lot of the time can be 
um scarier or feel like they're allowed to be scarier because yeah. you're just in and out um and so you don't have to stay within the sinking horrible feeling of um yeah something like a eternity of, of torture whatever yeah. it's being applied at the end there <laughs> um yeah it's just like a a thought a wondering and it leaves you more um wondering on the feeling rather than being guided through it yeah, I just think also because the reader's buy-in is such is so much smaller that you right. just can get away with just like killing off your characters. Like it's one thing to read a, a 500 page novel and have your character just just untimely die at the end, and it's just be like, well, that's that's all, folks. It's another to do it in like a 20 page short story and just be like, and then he burned in hell for all eternity. Like you just, I think a reader is much more forgiving and much more willing to accept that kind of thing when their, their time buy-in is significantly shorter. Yeah. And I think King uses that uh, to its fullest extent. And that's, some, that's something I do think that this story does as well. Um, we kind of, mm -hmm. we kind of, the guy gets to live because the, the format of the story is like someone recounting um, this experience they lived through, but it's, that doesn't mean it ends on a hopeful note. No, <laughs> right. Quite the opposite, actually. Just, mm -hmm. just imagine if Shirley Jackson's The Lottery was a 500-page novel. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just think how depressed you'd be. Yeah, yeah I would yeah. not have read it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, how many of y'all have listened to the podcast, The Magnus Archives? Yeah, I did uh, a, a yeah. bit. I think I got through the first... Hundred episodes mm -hmm. while I was playing Dark Souls. That's actually great uh, <laughs> background. <to that. laughs> great background noise. It is this 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 story feels very Magnus Archives e oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um in that it's just like this kind of short contained story about a specific kind of fear. Um, and I think in the way it's written, it's kind of written as someone recounting an event that happened to them. It's just it's it's very much that. And it, so if you're a listener out there and you haven't listened to the magnus archives it's an audio um audio drama that is available basically in any podcatcher that is basically hundreds of episodes very similar to this where they're just someone is recounting a scary event that they went through um, and there's also an interconnecting narrative through it that expands as the story goes on but i think you know personally my favorite episodes were the earlier season ones where mm -hmm. it was just mm -hmm. this this real kind of like individual just completely separate and not connected bits of scary storytelling yeah, definitely. There's multiple of those early episodes that I very much think about the image or particular feeling that they evoked. Um, yeah, and and bringing them up sometimes. Um, and I think yeah, a good direct comparison is that ending of yeah, this person didn't die, um, but inflicting that fear uh, <laughs> not only about their own lives but everyone else. Mm -hmm. I think is mm -hmm. yeah, it was very much in line with the the same sort of themes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, everyone look forward to death because there's something <laughs> waiting for you there. At the bottom. At the bottom. <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> um, that was a lot of references to uh, the Dark Tower, right? I mean, yeah, there's the word the I'm gunslinger, assuming. so I kind of... <laughs> yeah, so the, the whole thing, there is an eye at the center of all things, James, and it's looking for me. The king is dead, but the gunslinger carries on. That is definitely all Dark Tower references. I mean, it, it is, but it's it's also not like mm -hmm. like huh. it's not like here, here's the thing is like i a matter i don't know what the thing that he is the thing waiting at the bottom is right like mm. and like, like our dark tower and all I mean, I mean unless you disagree with me matt and you're just like oh it's the crimson king or something but i don't think i don't think that's what we're talking about here no i i think it's more more dread more cosmic yeah. horror yeah um so, something something from the the dark beyond that, yeah, that is prim, our name yeah yeah, yeah. So yeah, that is definitely there is definitely a lot of dark tower stuff in here, but I think it's fun because it like I got to kind of chuckle at at the king is dead, but the gunslinger carries on. But I think for y'all, it just maybe increases the creepiness of it because you, this is imagery that is like completely nonsensical to y'all. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I I wanted to know more about what, <laughs> who this king was and well, uh, what's going to uh, happen after this. Yeah. There's a seven book series, Jarvis, with your name on it. So, uh, all right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I pass these classes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that is going to do it for Far Away and Far Day, which was our runner up in the contest. So let's move on to the winner of the first but not last Do the King Thing contest. This will be Tallulah's Cab Ride by Jody. Tallulah's Cab Ride by Jody. 
aka Pear Jane. Tallulah Panzer had been having a weird day even before she nearly died. Fucking Jenny, she'd thought in the moment before her forehead met the plastic barrier separating her from the cab's front seat. And then, eyes shuttered against the flickering hospital lighting, she touches the knot on her forehead. It's a volcano, she thinks, a volcano rising out of the seabed, lava fixing to erupt in scorching rivulets of pain. The doctor asks her what her name is, and she tells him, and thinks again, fucking Jenny. But it wasn't Jenny's fault that the cab almost killed the pedestrian. The gun wasn't Jenny's fault either, and what Tally saw after the gun was definitely not Jenny's fault, because that vision was the result of Mount St. Tally, and not a thing that actually happened. Definitely not, as Rain Man would say. Definitely Jenny, I'm home, Tally called as she opened the door to 19B. Jenny never responded to the Ricky Ricardo, but she never said she hated it, so Tally kept doing it for her own amusement. Dropping her purse on the entryway table, the one her grandmother had always referred to as the gas station, Tally saw Jenny and her heart sank. When she left for work that morning, her sister sat at the breakfast bar, and she sat there still. Lank hair fell away from her waxy face, and as Tally watched, Jenny absently dropped her pencil, opening and closing her hand with straight fingers. Tally thought of that move as the goose. Jin? Tally asked. Working on something new? A, a bludinol? Birds don't work for the woodies, Jenny muttered head down. Birds wouldn't look like birdies. They just look like birds. Tally blinked. Jenny was right. Create a hybrid of a bluebird and a cardinal and you'd get a purple cardinal. So who's the new Woody? Tally asked. Humies, Jenny said and held up her sketchbook. Tally's breath caught. In contrast to the sweet, weird woodland animal hybrids, Creatures Tally named during the long hours as a receptionist at Grey Advertising, the Rabimunk, the Squoose, the Possu Bear, and Tally's favorite, the Ricotter. Ginny's new hybrids stood out like blackened teeth on a smiling toddler. Jesus, Ginny, who's going to buy that? I don't care, Ginny said. Ginny never cared if her drawings sold. She never cared what she ate. She never cared what she wore. She never cared if she made any money. She only cared that she had time to draw, and since Grandma B.B. had willed them 19B, she had all the time she needed. Tally cared about everything. Tally shopped. Tally washed clothes. Tally spent nine hours a day answering phones and greeting assholes so Tally could pay bills and feed Jenny. B.B.'s apartment and minor inheritance had been a godsend, no rent or student loans put her about $80,000 ahead of most New Yorkers her age, but they still needed money to live. Their recurring tent at the Summer Sunday Art Fair, managed and rented by Tally, stocked with prints Tally ordered, draped in Tally's tablecloths, constituted Ginny's share of their modest income. Customers rarely engaged with Tally except to wax rhapsodic about her sister's extraordinary talent, but they paid cash for the prints, and that was enough. And some customers, they watched. The first lookie, a tall white guy in a buzz cut and salmon polo, arrived in the first week. His glance into the booth stopped him so short that an old woman with a granny cart clipped his ankles, and as he approached Ginny and Tally, her impressive stream of curse words flowed over him like a breeze. See anything you like, Tally had asked. If he has a granny card of his own, I bet he'll buy everything in the booth, she thought. What are they? he asked. She calls them woodies, Tally said, and nodded at her sister's bent head. Woodland creatures. Would you like to buy one? I don't, I don't have any petty cash on me, he said. Do you take credit cards? Tally laughed. Sorry, no. Cash only, petty or otherwise. I need approval. I'm new, and they haven't. 
Tally wondered how many New Yorkers would rush to their side if this guy started speaking in tongues. Can I help you with something, sir? He closed his eyes and inhaled, the kind of exercise her HR department gave employees when they filed complaints, but it worked. He opened his eyes and cleared his throat. I'm sorry. I was surprised by the content of the artwork. I don't have cash on me now, but would you mind if I stayed and tried to... I mean, I'm not going to sell it, but I really think someone I know would want to see it. Tally gazed at the looky loo with her mother's I have all the time in the world, Dick knows, so just keep trying, face. She was no gallery owner, but damned if she would let someone just copy her sister's work without even buying anything. Here, Jenny said, and Tally jumped. She held out an extra tablet and a pencil. Have at it. The looky took the paper from Jenny with something like reverence, using the tips of his fingers to pinch the paper from her grasp. He stepped to the side of the tent, crouched low so the baking asphalt, and began to draw. After thirty or so minutes, during which Tally sold two squooses and a possum bear to a gaggle of teenagers, he showed his work. Tally relaxed. He was not competition. He'd copied the ricotta, the one where the little creature nibbled on a piece of meat wrapped in a leaf. His hand was good, Tally saw but his rendering had none of the original's gleaming intelligence. Tally mentioned once that she bet the Woodies talked, and Jenny said without hesitation, they can communicate with each other, but they can only talk with humans in a rudimentary way. Their physiology hasn't evolved to human speech. Makes sense, Tally said, as she always did when Jenny dropped a fact that wasn't a fact. After all, it did make sense. Animals wouldn't be able to talk like humans because they didn't have larynxes or even lips. But rudimentary speech? Well, sure. What are you planning to do with that? Tally asked. Just what I said, he said. I'll be back next week. He returned as promised, with two more lookies and an envelope of crisp bills to buy one of each woody. The third week, the lookies brought camp chairs and asked if they could sit in the tent. They paid her a hundred dollars for the opportunity to watch Jenny draw, whispering to themselves and taking notes. When Tally asked Jenny if she didn't think the lookies were pervs, Jenny said, No, they're doing research. They're fine. And that was that. Tally had no idea what they saw. She had no talent for art herself. She could letter pretty well and made all the signs, but everything else looked like a first grader's stick figure. It's because you don't see, Jenny said once, and Tally supposed she was right, but what she was supposed to see, Jenny never mentioned. She saw something in this Humi, though. That was the thing with Jenny's work. Her details compelled close study, like if Durer and Bosch had a baby. Another hybrid, her mind shrieked with a touch of hysteria. But a detail on the Woody meant a flea, on the chip bunny's ear, grains on the squoose's antlers, a fine-haired honeybee shambling over a black-eyed Susan behind the ricotta. Details on this humi monstrosity included blood trickling from a slit in the thing's neck just above a butterfly collar. The loathsome, exquisite feathers sprouting from its face must have taken hours. A furry hand slipped into a bulging suit jacket. It's a gun. Tally thought a gun, and the hand seemed aged under the fur and the forehead. What made you decide to switch tracks? Tally asked, throat clicking. It's getting late, Jenny said. It's only six. You know what I mean, Jenny said, looking up for the first time. Tally stepped back into the BB's gas station. Keys jangled to the floor. What do you mean? Jenny cocked her head. She thinks I'm pretending I don't know, Tally thought. Never mind, Jenny said. Fine then, Tally said. I'm going to shower and head downtown to meet Josh. The robot, Jenny asked, eyes back on her sketch pad. Yes, the robot, Tally said. Funny dynamic Josh was anything but a robot, but Jenny wouldn't refer to him any other way. Tally knew it was because of his work as a mechanical engineer for some corporation. 
but the jibe still rankled. Tally headed into the bathroom for her shower. Do you like the music? The cabbie asked, startling Tally. Jenny had suggested she take a cab because it would help her see better. Tally suspected her sister hoped the cab ride would mellow her feelings for Josh. I like it, she said, and she did. It sounded like belly dancing music. I like New York in June, he said. How about you? Tally smiled. I like a Gershwin tune. He laughed, and his delight delighted her. Fucking Jenny, she thought. Trying to spoil her New York June evening with horror show artwork, and that's when the brakes squealed and when her head slammed into the partition. And people always said accidents happen in slow motion, but they happen in a single burst of lightning from a clear sky, splitting your head like that horrible red eye in the Humi's forehead. And please God, don't let that be my final thought. And then the cabbie opened his door. And he was a giant. He was a belly-dancing helicopter of a giant. And a kid, a kid, pounded on the car, waved around something shiny, a gun. It was the Humi's gun. And that would be her final thought. And then she stumbled out of the car herself. Dumb move, Tallulah. Tallulah. The little boy is going to shoot you dead, and she fell to the ground and threw up and found herself eye to eye with a ricotta. Not Jenny's ricotta. Jenny's ricotta had brown, almost black eyes, and this one's eyes seemed to have wedding rings in them and seemed even more intelligent than Jenny's woodies. With this ricotta, she could carry on some very nice conversations about cabbages and oysters and tea time. The creature sniffed her pile of vomit and cocked its head, and drool fell from her mouth. Hi, Woody, she said. The ricotta tilted its head, like a dog, she thought, a dog, and barked at her. She winced at the sound, and its head drew back and then dipped. She became sure it was apologizing for the noise, and what a nice creature to apologize to a perfect stranger. Just before she slipped into unconsciousness, she smiled at it, and it smiled back, and another thought swam up, and then blackness. Now, sitting on white paper and shielding her pained eyes against the ER fluorescence, she recalls about that odd bark and how she wanted to take the animal home to Ginny, a real live Woody, for their pet. That kid would have killed you if you had, she thinks, and knows that to be true, even though she also knows the animal never existed. Definitely not. Tally lays on her side, arm over her eyes. She thinks about the tender egg jutting from her forehead and about standing up Josh and about whether she can run the Sunday booth with a concussion. She tries not to think about the thought that drifted up before she faded to black. Ricotters are real, her darkening mind had whispered. If ricotters are real, bunny monks could be real. Possum bears could be real. Squooses could be real. Humies could be real. It's getting late, Jenny had said. It's getting late. This one <laughs> here. How do we how do we handle this, Matt? How do we handle this? This is one that is the most Dark Tower referency. So I think the right way to handle it is to ask Alex, yes. <laughs> what do you think is happening in this story? <laughs> oh, um, am I on the the spot right now? No, you are. no other. Okay, it's all you well, completely. <laughs> okay, so I I'll, I'll put in this in in two ways. One, um, like my specific guesses, and then two, what like my general feeling as an independent story without any other knowledge of it. Sure, was. sure. So on that level, just taking it by itself, it felt like, um, it definitely felt a bit more like a first chapter than a self-contained mm -hmm. short story. Um, but I also I could have bought that if it if it was on its own um it's one of those things where like i feel like i would have to read in on all the little things and sort of do some reader response and like what does what do these things mean to me um and fish out the meaning more like poetry than your more straightforward uh short story that's fair yeah um and something dealing with uh sort of the um unreality of the the socially constructed reality that's the kind of thing that i would um be looking at it with um now on the specific side it seems that okay well the sister has um some kind of supernatural power 
the shining uh, the shining yeah <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah okay um or yeah and king calls it like 12 different things throughout all his books but it's the touch it's that it's thing, the shining yeah. it's the, okay. yeah yeah clairvoyant yeah and uh main character gets uh, that border between uh the uh natural and the supernatural broken down um sees these horrible things which i don't even know if they're actually taking that shape or that's just like the interpretation of seeing this thing um and that there is some murderous one-eyed feather-faced throat slit (laughs) old hand (laughs) with a gun thing uh that kills people um i assume like more of a grim reaper kind of role um but maybe more existentially terrifying um i I love this so much (laughs) (laughs) i'm glad um that's about all i've got i think um there's also this something about this uh mountain or rock volcano that i that's that's the one that is the furthest from me i think I, i don't think i can grasp that even within the confines of the story the, the, the volcano is just the 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 bump on her the head bump. yeah oh yeah. but okay i thought there was like a mountain like named um it's it's oh just we're talking Mount about Mount, Mount say tally yeah okay. yeah she just names the bump on her head all right well, which is very cause... which is very stephen king it's like okay. it's one of those like touches <laughs> of of personal detail and character flourish well yeah. i thought it was a specific location so <laughs> <laughs> i mean you never know. You never um, know. Where would it be? And the last thing is just that the uh, the random person buying the art was some sort of paranormal researcher, or maybe something paranormal themselves. Yeah, that's not mm. that's not far off. Actually, that's pretty good. Yeah, I, I think this story was a lot of fun, and I, I'm the, the, there's the author is doing a lot of different things because obviously there are like this is actually to explain it to y'all. This is. The car accident where the little uh, raccooner and the boy with the gun is a scene from the Dark Tower. And we are just seeing it from the perspective of a character that I don't believe exists at all within that book. There is a cab and there's a cab driver, but I don't think we see the person that's in the the riding along in the cab. So the author has kind of invented a character there witnessing an event that happens in, I believe, book seven. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, yeah book yeah. seven. Well, it, it fits rather. It makes neatly. a lot more sense. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's very funny. It's very fun from the perspective of a Dark Tower reader because like pretty much as soon as the cab crashes, my mind was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> cab ride. And and then I realized like what was about to happen due to the context of the uh, the woodsies, um, mm-hmm. et, et cetera. But, but it's so funny because the author, on top of building on a scene that actually happens in the book, she is doing a lot of a lot of King references everywhere. Like mm-hmm. this idea mm-hmm. that this 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 girl and her sister have their own kind of little code to call things. Like King loves creating words. Like like they call the, the you know Woody and the Humies and the mm-hmm. and like the like to have their own kind of coded language with each other is very specific. The idea that she has a sister that is um um I'm trying to think of a, a politically correct way of saying this, but is not is not um. Neurotypical. She's neurotypical. Thank you. Um, mm. And that, like, King, even even in bad ways and times, has used neuroatypical people to have strong psychic powers. Um, you know, that's something that he did a lot and in uh, successfully in some ways and unsuccessfully in a lot of other ways um, in some <laughs> of his, his, his works from 20 years ago. And so, um, so that's, that's a very kind of King thing to do. Um, and just the, the way that the characters talk and interact, I think it just, this just, it, 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 you can tell that the author worked very hard to channel that mm-hmm. kind of King tone. Mm-hmm. I very much enjoyed the, the, the prose and how the mm-hmm. character's voice gets in, into all of it. Um, yeah. The the little thing with the the cab driver with the I like New York in June. How about you? I like a Gershwin tune. I had no idea yeah. what that is, but I thought yeah, it was cute. But it so. sounds nice. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just I mean that's like the thing about Stephen King. Um, if you ever read, you will notice almost immediately because Matt no- notices almost immediately. He'll just like take a random character that's going to be in two pages and we're never going to see them again, and he'll go okay, um, let's spend a few pages with this guy and just sure. characterize the <laughs> shit out of him because I just find this an, an 
interesting, fascinating character. And of course, this author did not have, you know, pages and pages to work with here. But I think that was their attempt to channel a kind of Kingism where we just take time to characterize this random character that's just going to going to going to fly out of our story as soon as we're done with them. I, so yeah. I like that a lot, too. Yeah, yeah another uh, another. Th- Go ahead, Jarvis. Oh yeah, no. I was I was just gonna say, as someone who isn't a avid King reader but does know a bit, I do like how this story does play um, with the thin line between r- reality and uh, fantasy, and how that mm-hmm. does really get crossed uh, within our own minds. I'm, I'm thinking mostly about Jenny, how Jenny seems to be completely de- detached from from the world, except when it comes to the. Fan, to the fantasy creatures that she does um, draw, right? And yeah. later on, we do find out that that is a glimpse of a reality that we don't really see. And I and I like how Tally within the story is completely against this idea. Um, so yeah, I think that that, that was a really nice die, uh, dynamic that really kept me reading throughout this. Yeah, I, I love this idea that Ginny thinks Tallulah is just kind of pretending like she doesn't understand or doesn't know. Mm. Like, I love that one. It's yeah. like the, the, it's getting late and she says it's only six. And it's like, you know what I mean? And it's like, no, she actually doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, that just shows, <laughs> that just shows the way Ginny is kind of so disconnected um, from everything. And uh, like as- or, makes assumptions that Tallulah is just on the same page as her constantly. Or, or maybe Tallulah does know, but she's just in deep denial <laughs> about what mm. she knows. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting that like, she she knows her sister has this peculiar you know imagination to draw these things and then um she kind of it's really interesting the ways in which tally kind of laughs off the weird things that keep happening like yeah just the 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 people she nicknames the lookies just like she's not at all bothered by the fact that these this group of Mm -hmm. people just keep showing up to watch Ginny draw (laughs) um Mm -hmm. it's just like and and you were absolutely right there alexandra this is a, a a group within uh, the Dark Tower story that is collecting information on um, the quest to the tower and what's going on there. And so um, he sees the, uh, the I think it's a raccooter, right? That's what that's what yeah. you called it, a, which a, in... Ricotter, I think. It was, ricotter, it was just, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, because yeah. oh, yeah, it's a raccoon otter. Yeah, raccooter. sounds nice, nicer. Um, <laughs> which in the Dark Tower is something called a Billy Bumbler, um, which is the, one of the best... Very cute. The best the it's best boys, word. the best uh-huh. boys. Mm-hmm. We yeah. love, we love <laughs> boy so much. There's um, something about that bark. Yeah. <laughs> it was so good. It was so good. It's so fun. I mean, that's, that's like at the end of the day, this is just a very, very fun story. It's very well written um, mm-hmm. and it's very clever in the way it weaves Kingisms and then direct King connections and direct dark tower connections. And it's just like, you can tell the author sat down and said, I'm going to try to do something really fun with this. And I think I think she succeeded, and obviously our uh, our listeners and patron supporters agreed because they voted her as the winner. The, the most sort of king thing to me, I mean, other than the overt plot stuff, is is how rich it is with these these characterization mm-hmm. beats of of like it's it's not just it's not just uh, uh, Jenny drops her pencil. It's like this specific gesture that Tally thought of as the goose. Um, and you know mm-hmm. she comes home and she she does a, a Ricky Ricardo impression, and it's just like <laughs> e- everything is is stuffed with like very specific, often culturally referential or mm-hmm. or just like very um, imagery based or or just otherwise very strong and pronounced characterization mm-hmm. in, yeah. in ways like that. Definitely, I really. I really like Tally's like, I don't have any petty cash on me. Do you take credit cards? And she says, sorry, no cash only petty or otherwise. I think that's a great, <laughs> that's a great beat great of line. characterization there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it keeps the, um, the whole piece kind of delightful throughout. It's um, it's definitely, it feels like someone wrote this out and then went back and kind of went through each line and made sure that there was something either very entertaining or revealing in each one. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I did something I did want to comment on was just the, I, I, you, you can tell the, um, dynamic between the two sisters is pretty complicated where, um, Tallulah like definitely uh, resents her sister like a little bit, but not that much and is mostly supportive, Mm -hmm. um, you know, buys into, uh, her understanding of, um, like the world a little bit, or at least, acknowledges that it is self-consistent basically 
Um, and we see a little bit of how uh, Ginny is like, she's got her, I mean, what uh, Tally would call her like delusions probably, but they also are self-serious and make sense. Like the whole thing with the birdies being mixed, it would just mm-hmm. be another bird. Um, it's it's interesting. And I thought that was uh, a cool re- revealing thing. Um, yeah. Another thing about their dynamic is the whole with uh, Tally's boyfriend being a robot. I was like, yeah. okay interesting and then by the end i'm like he probably literally is a robot <laughs> but <laughs> yeah probably or maybe not who knows could just be a sister thing i mean jenny seems seems to be onto something the, the the fun thing about this story to me is that it works as just this is their funny sister dynamic where she really just doesn't like her sister's boyfriend and so she's developed a pet name for him that will annoy her sister and then also it can be like huh <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe she's onto something there um i i like the a mechanical engineer for some corporation mm-hmm. um that's a mm. that's another winking reference to the dark tower um yeah but i don't i don't actually know matt i mean did i did i miss something here like i don't see that if we're doing a specific robot reference no. there are robots in the dark tower series I, I mean i think that's this is one of the delightful things about it is is that jody doesn't go all the way into the specific like this could mm-hmm. just be some young mid-level functionary at sombra corporation or it could mm-hmm. be a total red herring it could just be some some guy or he could <laughs> right. literally be a robot we don't know yeah. and and i mm-hmm. like not knowing you know i just like i i like um uh i like not actually knowing who the people are who keep coming to the uh to, to the booth because scott i actually had a different interpretation of who those were by the way oh really well well i wasn't sure but my thought was actually that they were, I don't, know, I don't want to spoil this for our for our friends, but the people who go through the doorways on visits is what I'll say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And and you seem to have thought it's they were part enough. of a different group of people. Yeah, entirely. I thought they were just, I thought they were just Tet Corporation folks. That yeah, are, I, I, are, I got that's what you thought. Are working that, for that, the Calvinists, yeah. Um, that might have, right. that might be the case. They, they didn't <laughs> seem... <laughs> And and that's the thing is I I don't actually know if there's like proof one way or the other, um, but it, it, we could have a conversation about it, and that's what's fun about the story to me. Yeah, I think I think you're right. There there's there's a different version of the story that leans so far into the Dark Tower references that it takes away all the magic and and mystery of it, mm-hmm. um, where it's just like. And this was a person from the Tet Corporation, and it was their first day, and so they didn't have their company Tet credit card yet. Um, uh-huh. But I think you're right that the, the 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 magic of it is that it's it's just it kind of opens a window to stuff that mm-hmm. me and Matt recognize, but it doesn't lead you through the door of it. Um, yeah. and that's a yeah. lot of fun. And and Talula is kind of a, a great protagonist because she's sort of avoiding thinking about all this weird shit that's happening around Mm -hmm. her Mm -hmm. because it's disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. Until her head's smashed open and she can no longer not see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. I mean, imagine how fucking weird it would be if like your sister's been drawing these, these, you know, hybrid creatures for years and years and you're smash into a a side of a cab, walk out the door and, Oh, there's one of them right there standing (laughs) at, looking at you. Hey, hey, we're on the metaphorical, uh level as well as just uh she's had this sister with an apparent disability and then now has an event that basically makes her have the same thing and now she's got to f- relate and fear the same things oh yeah um, i hadn't looked at it that angle but I, mm-hmm. I like that a lot yeah yeah and suddenly i think I, obviously this is something that goes beyond the, the the bounds of the story but like i can imagine this character now understanding uh, Ginny so much more and how Ginny sure is not as good at with the um, normal neurotypical tasks, but is actually very good at the things that she has to deal with. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. I mean, I, I'd, there's so much, there's so much to like here. Like I just, I have the story open in front of me and as we're talking, I'm just kind of scrolling through to different parts. And every time I stop my scroll, I find another thing I like and want to talk about. But, um, I think, I think we've kind of reached the end of this, uh, unless any of y'all had anything more that you wanted to say. No, I'm good. No, the pros are, are, are fan- fantastic. Love, love the style of this. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I, I, the last thing I was going to pull out was the way kind of the climactic scene happens. It's kind of separated out with dashes 
which mm-hmm. it's, it's funny because I usually do the audio book, but it still seems kind of Stephen Kingy to me, <laughs> uh, even though I never actually see the dashes on the page. Yeah, I know. I think you're right. I think the the it, it is the the kind of shift here helps really set the pace of how everything is kind of happening at at the same time. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's really great. Um, so that is Tallulah's Cab Ride by Jody. Uh, congratulations on winning first prize, Jody. And congratulations to the three stories that we talked about today. And folks, all of y'all out there, I think, what was it, the number we settled on again, Matt? I think it was 39 stories we got in total for this contest. 39 so. stories. And I mean, they're, they're all so fun to read. Um, yeah, I mean, that's mm-hmm. the, the, the thing is that only only one could win, but like all 39 were a, a joy for me to read yeah. um, so my favorite mm-hmm. didn't win <laughs> and i won't say which one it was so everyone that didn't win you can believe that your story was my favorite yeah mm-hmm. i mean it was it was, it was. all of you i yeah. mean one one person's right so yeah <laughs> so why not all of you it's exactly. schrodinger's favorite yeah. email um, me and i'll tell you which one was my favorite <laughs> alexandra at doofmedia.com oh yeah that is we do have we need to use those more yeah, but I, I never checked them. mine. I so still I don't nobody's... have one. <laughs> you just ask for one, Jarvis. Yeah. Jarvis, literally, just send me, <laughs> but send me I, a ping. I, 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 I will, but I already have four different G, uh, Gmails that I don't use. That's so. fair. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I like God. I have so many Gmails. <laughs> I have so many <laughs> mails on my mail thing. It's and ridiculous. Yeah, the, most of my emails at this point, including my student email, are just like just infested with spam it's, it's and i've got to make a that. new one uh and i don't want to but it's all junk like especially for those out there that don't know whenever you make a, a, a an email address public for like a podcast let's say um it gets signed oh, yeah. up for every possible thing you can imagine and oh, no. if i ever if i ever don't respond to your email it's because it was mixed in with a lot of junk that i was just trying to delete through so it's it's wild out there i wish we had i mean google has pretty good spam filters but it doesn't pick up everything that's for sure oh no yeah i'm i'm, but, I'm still getting uh uber eats e- emails <laughs> every day oh my god yeah no. um but that is the end of this contest we are absolutely going to do this again and like we've said many times we are hoping that we will organize it a bit better next time around so it doesn't take quite as many months to get from the submission time to the winners being announced um we will do better but we thank everyone for their patience and we hope each and every one of you that submitted this time will submit again and we hope those of you that kind of waited it out and and to see uh will give this a shot next time because it was so much fun to read all the stories um from what we've received from our winners and from the other people that submitted stories it seems like they all had a great time doing them um so that that makes us very very happy and i hope all 39 of you since you're all writers check out do the right thing because it's it's literally the show for you yeah yeah actually um one of the submitted stories that i i very much enjoyed was a story that came from a do the right thing episode so that was really Mm. cool to see that or maybe actually maybe they wrote it for this first and then submitted to do the right thing i'm not entirely sure but (laughs) i thought it was really cool so you know what they say ka is a wheel so Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we my, m- my mom says that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, th- there will be water if God wills it. Of course. Right. This is a lot of fun. Uh, okay, how many more can we do? Uh, <laughs> I'm having such a great time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that is going to do it for us. Uh, Alexander Jarvis, great talking with you as always. And thank mm-hmm. you for for coming on and guesting here to help us talk through these stories. Um, it was a lot of fun. And yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, and and thanks for hosting the um, contest as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, we hope uh, we hope you get some more writers over there from from this thing. I hope I hope to see some some of y'all's names on that that do the right thing subreddit. So uh, we will welcome we y'all so and give you extra favor for being new people. We always do that. <laughs> yeah. We'll That's give you true, a big yeah. hug. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> and with I mean, our voices, you, mm. a voice hug. A voice hug. Voice. Yeah, Ugh, that sounds like a innuendo. <laughs> I, I have a, a side ASMR channel actually. I've been experimenting with. <laughs> I don't know. Do I? 
See, the thing is, I, you could, and I, I would, I would. Mm-hmm. At this point, I'm, I'm just believing you. So one person listening to this knows whether I do or don't. <laughs> It, it's me when I listen it's to this you. episode again. No, it's the same person whose story is your favorite. Um, exactly. Mm. Yes, I will reveal yeah. it um, through a, a secret uh, A A R G. That's what they're called, right? The augmented reality A-A-R-G? games. A R G. Oh, A R G. Yeah. I don't know. The, the arg. Never mind. Arg. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm gonna geocache it. Sorry. Never mind. <laughs> Isn't A A R G an insurance company? It, it might be. Oh no, that's that's a A A R P. Ah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the old people company. Yeah, this is this is closer to what our podcast is actually like. For the record. what, what have you done yes. to us? Um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up there. Thanks again Please. for guesting, and and we hope you guys enjoyed do the king thing, and we hope you'll be around for the next one. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. <sighs> Alexandra, you're supposed to say, "May you have twice the number." Come on, Jesus. what they said. I've, I've never read. <laughs> 